It's a great pleasure to this week welcome back to our podcast series, Victor Davis Hanson, uh, the commentator on American politics, on American military policy, on American foreign policy, uh, than whom there is no more accurate, no more interesting. Uh, Victor, of course, is senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I gather it's this month uh, that you're doing your annual month at Hillsdale College. Yes, I am. That's where I am right now. And uh, I start with a kind of a plaint, the plaint of somebody who uh, finds r- r- apposite quotation sometimes from the lore of American baseball. There's one day uh, back in New York when Casey Stengel is managing the Mets, and they've been doing terribly. And as he go as he's going off the field one day, he's heard to mutter, don't nobody here know how to play this game. That has seemed to be one of the most useful quotations for just about anything. And it seems to me extremely relevant to the question of our, quote, policy towards Syria and its rather muddled and scary execution. Am I right that they don't really know how to play this game? Well, I- you are. I mean, the Congress is to be bypassed, consulted, postponed, and, and it's in limbo now. And Assad is to be attacked, removed, let stay in power, negotiated with legitimate, illegitimate. WMD is to be destroyed, left alone, punished, the use of its punished, uh, set of standard red lines of the United States, red lines of Obama. I don't know whose red lines they are anymore. But there's confusion. The question is, why is there confusion? And I think it originates from two contradictory propositions that Obama has made, I guess, or his sentiments that he holds. One is he really, really, really does not like people dying in Syria. It bothers him to no end. And two, he really, really, really does not want to use force to stop people dying in Syria. And so to square that circle, he's been under a lot of pressure from what I would call the interventionist establishment and the centrist Democrats and Republicans who feel that to do something in Syria would advance our interests by harming Iran and Hezbollah and and Assad. And then the humanitarian interventionists, the Samantha Power group that feels that we have a moral obligation. But he held off on that. But those two groups for the last year have pressured him. He held off because he knew the Congress, the American people, our allies, the UN, nobody wanted to go in there because nobody wanted to sort that mess out, especially given our experiences in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. So, so what did he do? He just offhandedly one day thought, you know what? I'll square that circle by saying WMD will be what I will intervene on. Don't use WMD. If I see a bunch of WMD moving around, and he was thinking, A, nobody would ever call the bluff of a U.S. president, and B, my entire life I've talked and nobody's really asked for consequences. So he gave the press conference, said it again, and went home. And um, I don't think in his right mind he ever believed that he would have to produce something. And now he wants to stop the killing and he doesn't want to use force, so... We're back. We're going in a 360-degree circle. You know, there's a kind of an intimation in what you've just said <clears throat> that if we had not given, if the president had not given the red line warning, that actually Assad would not have undertaken to cross that red line. I don't think he would have. I think uh, I think Senator Sessions said that explicitly. And uh, I think what Obama understood was that he was going to continue to express anguish, say stupid things like Assad should go when he doesn't have any ability, but nevertheless not make them explicit threats. And he was going to kind of wade through this situation and not get involved, as unfortunately he did in Libya, that ended in Benghazi. But the pressure mounted so much and the, the body toll increased so much that he felt so bad that he thought that maybe a bluster about WMD might get him off the hook with his own domestic critics and people abroad. But unfortunately, they called his bluff, and now we're in a situation where we're in the credibility of the United States, apparently we're told, is on the line, and we're in these negotiations about WMD that's killed 1% of the total fatalities on both sides in Syria. And the success of those negotiations are in the hands of Vladimir Putin and 
and Bashar Assad, whom we told thought was illegitimate and had to leave. So I think the best escape from these bad choices now is just to kind of keep quiet and let Putin do what Putin does and uh, not do anything at all and just hope that Assad doesn't try to use WMD and be flagrantly defiant in our face. You know, years ago, a guy named James Rosenau <coughs> brought out an edited book titled The Domestic Sources of Foreign Policy. Actually, I was I contributed to one of the chapters. It's a long time ago. But that phrase conveys a great deal of meaning. What are then the domestic sources of his particular foreign policy as regards uh, Syria at the moment? Well, I think he thought that uh, mainstream Diane Feinstein, uh, Harry Reid, and Nancy Pelosi would would think would always be with him because they didn't want to endanger everything from gun control to amnesty to Obamacare, and he was right about that. But I don't think he understood that the left wing, the Michael Moore, Cindy Sheehan, Dennis, old Dennis Kucinich, those guys in the House and Senate would be against him. And if they were against him, they wouldn't be so numerous, but about 20%, 30% of the Democrats are against him. And then he thought that the interventionist Jacksonians or neocon, whatever term, they would always flock toward him, but, and the libertarians would be in a small isolation, I suppose it would be small, but what's happened is he's lost, he knew he was going to lose the, the left anti-war group, and he knew he was going to lose the Rand Paul Tea Party isolationists, but what he didn't realize is that he was going to lose the Jacksonians, people like myself, maybe you, because they feel that if you're going to go out and try to go into Afghanistan and Iraq again, the implementation of that policy requires uh, a very skilled team, and when things go bad, and they will go bad, it requires, I guess, for want of a better word, stick to it in this. And I recalls that quote from Matthew Ridgway, the only thing worse than getting into a bad war is losing it. And I just have a feeling that when he goes into Syria and bombs, he doesn't know the purpose. He doesn't know what he wants. But more importantly, all these people who are pressuring to go in there will back out if it turns into be something like, you know, the Marine barracks or Libya or Afghanistan. They're just not up to it. Well, it seems to me we're in a total muddle at the moment. I read, I'm going to read to you and thus to all who are listening, uh, the opening paragraph of uh, your National Review article from, uh, let me see, from September 13. Quote, says Victor Hansen, we are contemplating going to war in Syria to help the opposition a lot and to hurt Assad some, or to help the opposition some and hurt Assad a lot, or to hurt Assad some and help the opposition some, or to force Assad to stop, or to leave, or to stop but stay, or to stop and leave, or to restore the word of the President, or the word of the United States, or the word of the international community, by bombing, or by threatening to bomb, but not bombing. Bombing. I'm breaking up on this word. Or by neither threatening to bomb, nor bombing, or to warn the Russians to stay out, or to welcome the Russians to come in, or to warn uh, the Russians to stay out and welcome the Russians to come in. Message, we are planning to do all kinds of things by not doing anything. Somehow I'm reminded. I wrote those things down uh, by going on to his speeches and the speech yeah. of John Kerry. You have to admit, Mil, the only advantage of all of that is that the Russians and the Syrians don't know what we're going to do either, I suppose, that we're so confused that perhaps... There's some utility in putting them on notice that on any give, given day, we don't know what we're doing. The only problem with that is that, there, as I said at the end, they they would reply to us, yeah, you don't know what you're doing, but there's one thing that's the common denominator. You're not going to end up doing anything. The so, uh, As I read that paragraph, something came to my mind, uh, namely King Lear. I don't have the exact words, but Lear raging against the waves and the, and the storm, says, I shall do such terrible things, I know not what they are, but what I'll do. That's the thought, if not not the exact words. There's something rather, for a young uh, American president, there's something rather dis, dis, disturbingly Lear-like about this. Yeah, or I've overused the, the simile of Hamlet. He's Some days he's going to act, some days he's not. I've used a lot of mythology 
yeah. Icarus with his little waxen wings um, flying far be- beyond his capability, or Phaethon who got his father's chariot and couldn't handle the steeds and scorched everybody. But he's clearly he clearly has been. Uh, uh, ass- I should say he's clearly assumed in his past careers, whether it in the academia or law or Chicago organizing that when he said something mellifluous and I don't know, his intonations hit the right cadences that people were impressed and they did things. He got his way. He obviously didn't have much of a resume and got the Nobel prize and he got into the Senate, et cetera, et cetera, got elected. Did I ever tag you of my first encounter with Barack Obama? I don't know if you did. I doubt it. Uh, it was on my regular radio program, and he was a guest. Uh, he, uh, because PR people had called up and said, you'll find this interesting. This young fellow who uh, uh, is at, actually at your law school uh, on a part-time basis and is um, uh, and had an African father and American mother, black and white, and he's now done a great memoir. And I said, sure, send him over. I told my producer, yes, book him. And he came, and I read the book, actually, uh, most of it at the time, and found it certainly of interest, but a little bit confusing uh, in its representation of the influences in his life. Uh, I didn't quite get all the genealogy straight. All the same, he was of interest as a guest, but nothing to me all that special. This was as he was gearing up to run for the state senate in Illinois. He had not yet, in fact, um, started that campaign. Uh, So it was just another night recording something, no, we did that one live. We did it live for two hours. He left, and my young producer, a very bright guy, uh, just out of Yale by two or three years, and he had already published his own book, uh, and he said to me, I don't know where that man's going, but I want to go with him. That guy is really going places. And I said, in my stupidity, what are you talking about? And he had been caught by the charisma. He had been caught by the mellifluousness that you're talking about. He had been caught by that assurance that whatever is said by this man has intrinsic validity because he's saying it. Yeah, uh, I think I think people from Yale who are young have that tendency to do that, like your producer. But I wish that Putin and Mr. Assad were from Yale and young, but unfortunately yeah. they went to a different school. And it's called Murder Incorporated, KJB, uh Baptist politics, whatever, and what it's not, it's worse than that they don't take Obama credible or that they don't listen to his uh, eloquence. They have almost a uh, perverse desire to embarrass him, as if to say, "We are so sick of your sermonizing that without muscularity, that we want to embarrass you in a gratuitous way, almost." So, and both the offer <coughs> to take over the gas weapons and move them, I guess, yeah. back, to, back to Russia. And then uh, the telltale letter in the Times just a few days ago, that seems to, uh, in some ways, cinch the deal or twist the knife. Yeah, I think emblematic of what I was trying to say in a symbolic, so, so Putin says uh, two days before he writes his letter, he says that Kerry is a pathetic and he's a liar. And then two days later, he says he and Obama get along really well. And uh, <laughs> he's basically saying to us, the American people, I get along really well with your president. I don't listen to anything to say. And I, in fact, call his secretary of state a liar and pathetic, and he didn't bother him a bit. And he, Putin has this, you know, this 19th century Russian Orthodox czarist view of Russian power. And uh, he doesn't mind if other people do. He just doesn't like people to give him moral humanitarian lectures and then he wouldn't mind it if they followed it up he would probably back down but he feels that it's he has a particular sacred duty to embarrass barack obama and so now he's thrown him a lifeline and brought him out of his immediate problem and then thrown him into a much bigger problem and that is we're going to hear about successes failures extensions delays postponement just like saddam did uh, for the next year or two, all over an issue that is largely irrelevant to the 99% of the people who are going to die in the next year in Syria. Here's a fellow um, writing in The Guardian in England, Simon Tisdall, 
yes. who um, uh, actually says something that you've said as well. Maybe he's cribbing from you, in fact. But I, I quote him, although the U.S. and Britain have portrayed Syria's untested agreement to give up its, nucle- its chemical weapons stockpile as a great advance, the affair has proved to be largely a sideshow uh, in a conflict in which conventional weapons have killed and maimed vastly more people and continue to do so. In one sense, Assad has gained the tacit go-ahead to prosecute the war, so long as he eschews nerve gas. In the wake of this dubious deal, the high tide of pressure for direct Western action peaked, then subsided. The, quote, killer moment passed. The yes. Syrian the Syrian leader now knows with a degree of certainty uh, that was lacking before Ghouta, that's the suburban neighborhood that was bombed with the gas, uh, that was lacking before Ghouta, that he may do almost anything he wants while ostensibly observing the new U.S.-Russian framework, free from fear of U.S. military retribution. Since Ghouta was not enough for Obama to win the backing of the American public or Congress for the use of force, more routine slaughter of the kind seen in the past two and a half years can hardly be expected to change attitudes. Yeah, I think what we'd say, I think I used that in some column, the only thing he has to... to his principle now is he's going, to, he's going to kill people in a in a non obscene way. In a clean way. Yeah, non obscene. If it's almost as if the would that the first ten people in Rwanda had been killed with sarin gas, and I guess according to Obama we would have intervened to save the next nine hundred thousand. But uh, Obama doesn't quite grasp that. But more importantly, this is a man that Obama ordered to leave office and said he was illegitimate. Now he's not only not illegitimate. He's legitimate enough to be discussing high stakes diplomacy over WMD with. So we're back where we are and where we are is where we began. It was simply the dilemma. Obama really, really doesn't like people dying in Syria and he really, really, really does not want to use force. Now, is this the first instance of his uh, gross ineptitude because of this, this conflicted soul? As you've outlined it, or do we have other instances of? No, we have first- all of them. We have all of them. He really, 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 really likes the fact that the surge worked and there's quiet in a, uh-huh. uh, uh, Iraq, but he really, really, really doesn't want to have one troop left there to ensure that because he wants to say that he got everybody out. He really, 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 really does want to surge like everybody tells him he has to in Afghanistan, but he really, really, really wants to have withdrawal dates at the same time. He really, really, really wants to stop Gaddafi and help the militia, but he really, really, really doesn't want to lead. So he's going to kind of square that circle, lead from behind, withdraw dates in Afghanistan, surges in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's what he does. And, and every single one of the, he really, really says we're going to have to close Guantanamo within a year because it's unconstitutional and immoral. But he really, really, really doesn't know what to do because some people say that it's got utility. He really, really wants to, try KSM in a civilian court and show that we're not going to resort to Neanderthal military tribunals, but then he really, really, really understands there's a big downside to that. That's pretty much his administration. He really, really, really says that he's not going to stand for any obstruction of Obamacare and that this is partisan politics, but he really, really now understands that you know the, the employer mandate or the unions, and he doesn't know what to do. So, Have you ever heard of Yellow Kid Weil? Yeah. Great con man. He invented some of the great confidence games that are still played. Uh, and one of his great maxims uh, with regard to uh, being all things to all people all of the time, he says, the big deal is to keep talking. Don't ever stop talking, and they won't catch on. Yeah, well, Hillary caught on, you remember, in the 2008 primary when she re- she ran that devastating, three. who are you going to talk to at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's a crisis? Uh-huh. And that was based on, and I don't have the exact number, but I think it was over 140 present votes in the Illinois legislature. So she made that argument that he can't vote yes or no. And uh, the other thing about it that is disturbing is what animates him. And apparently, uh, when Kerry said that Assad was a reformer and a moderate or that Putin uh can be a partner. Obama never exercises that degree of conciliatory moderation toward any of his domestic people. So juxtapose with 
bowing, the Cairo speech, the Al Arabia interview, all of this weakness and uh, obsequiousness on the world stage is this vicious anger at fat cats, the 1%, the corporate jet owners, mm-hmm. the guys who didn't know when to stop profiting, the guys who didn't build that business, the guys who at some point in their life should have stopped you know, making money. And uh, that's what's so strange that you really do get the feeling that the people he sees as his enemies and that animates him to real venom are the people he says to the Latino caucus, we got to punish our enemies. But he never uses that word about Assad or Putin or uh, the North Koreans or uh, the Iranians. He would never say, you know, during the 2009 spring uprising when there's almost a million people in the streets of Tehran. He didn't say that to the Iranians, we got to punish our enemies. He only reserves that to people who he thinks are nativist or et cetera. And now he's already on to the next, the next war, uh, Syria to get our attention off Syria. It's going to be a new war against the gun owners and the assault weapons people who are responsible for the latest violence, just as there was a war against uh, the Republicans who had warred against Sandra Fluke and professional women. Mm-hmm. And then we had the war against the polluters who wanted Keystone, the war against the homophobes who wouldn't uh, tolerate gay marriage. The war well, the, cho- choosing domestic enemies is in a way less dangerous than, than choosing foreign enemies. It is. It is. And uh, the Republicans uh, didn't have quite the deterrence that uh, – Putin and Assad did to, to make Obama stop, but he does believe that uh, that his chief interest is to demonize a particular profile of American, yeah. and then uh, they will uh, that anger and that split and that divide will then give uh-huh. him maybe fifty one percent majority. Well, now you you do know that that is in a way directly drawn from the handbook for radicals by yeah. Saul Alinsky. It is. I don't know if he actually read it, but he seems to absorb its lectures, uh, its lessons. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure he read it as community organizer. Yeah, he probably yeah. did. But there's always a psychodrama or a melodramatic war to be waged, and he'll, he'll gear up for another one. But where does this all lead us abroad? And I, I guess the answer is that we just hope that um, what is war and what is peace? War is basically, if I could quote some the classical consensus on war, it is that people go to war when they're not sure about who their rel- what the relative strength is, and they they stay at peace when they're pretty sure what everything is like and nobody be so stupid to do something. And then war is the litmus test or the testing or the barometer that that tells us this was what it, what was true. So we're strong we, but, in the Middle East and they're weak. And they to achieve something through war, you have to have. Uh, credibility. Credibility, not only that you've got a lot of force, which uh, could be overwhelming, but that you have the intention and the capability of using that force. And the problem is that, see, after a war and everybody gets killed, then we find out that, you know, Hitler really wasn't as strong as the Soviet Union, the United States and Britain and France. But uh, France, they did not have a sufficient strength or deterrence to tell him that before. So war had to remind everybody what was eternally true. So what's eternally true is in the Middle East, the United States does have much more power than Putin and much more power than Assad. But we're going to probably end up in a war because they don't believe that anymore. And we're going to have to go through the whole thing to convince them that what was true is really true. Hold a minute. Hold a minute. You just, you've just said we're probably going to end up in a war. What do you mean? And specify. Well, I think something along the following lines because I think Assad is not brilliant and Putin for all his animal cunning is not brilliant. At some point, it won't be enough for them to humiliate us and draw these out. Somebody uh, will tell Assad, hey, you did this once. Why don't you use WMD again? Just to A, remind your friends that you're unpredictable, that you can kill some people in a moment's notice that the Arab world still sees you as a powerful strongman that could attack Israel, and most importantly, to really rub the United States again in their nose in the dirt. And if he were to do that, Obama would effectively, I think, be taken out of the decision uh, to whether to attack. There would be so much pressure from people like you and me who were 
probably against the initial intervention who would say, you know what, we have no choice now. And there would be a war. And I think that the way he would conduct it. Well, if, if there would be a war, that means that Assad would have miscalculated. He would miscalculate. And the reason that there are wars is because during peace, the relative strength and the willing to use that strength is somehow been miscommunicated. And that's what deterrence and preparedness, they break down and then war is always sitting, as Trotsky said, it's around there to find you. And it just sort of says, oh, you guys have a problem. Nobody can figure out who's strong and who's weak. Let me come in and help you. And so go fight it out. And now you've learned who's strong and who's weak. So the war that you envisage, uh, since if, if you get that miscalculation from Assad, would be American uh, air assault, as we were originally threatening? Or would it, to use the tire, well, tire cliche, also, also involve boots on the ground? Yeah, well, the problem with an air assault is what I've been writing about, is that it seems clear, strategic, unbelievably small, shot across the bow. But if you start to attrite his assets, he does have surface-to-ship missiles. And his ally, maybe he has Bilal. We know that they attacked an Israeli ship with one. So maybe he has 30 or 40. What happens if he sends a couple out and, and hits a frigate? Uh-huh. We can't allow that to happen. And then we would we would up that an unbelievably small uh, attack and over WND into something like regime change. If that were to happen, he's got 10,000 missiles, and if he's going to go down, he might as well go down by sending them into Israel. Who knows, maybe with WMD. If he does that, then Israel's going to respond. If Israel responds, Hezbollah is basically humiliated. They will try to do something. Iran and Putin. And what if Putin were to say, based on what he thinks about Obama, saying, you know what, this is getting out of hand. I want to warn anybody in the Middle East that Iran is sacrosanct. Anybody who attacks Iran is going to be attack on us. Well, that's an empty boast and it has no credibility. But for Obama, they might believe that it does actually mean something uh, and Obama would, uh, would would take it seriously. So I can see a Spanish Civil War s- scenario where everybody's involved. Just because nobody made it clear that the United States has overwhelming military, economic, and political influence, and it's not very wise to try to upset the existing regional order. And Obama well, never understood that. This is a hell of a scenario that you just outlined. What? We can even get more scary ones, but I don't think that if Obama, if Assad is stupid enough to use WMD as an emblematic or iconic act that, uh, Obama will have a choice. He will be forced by pop, even popular opinion, the Congress to act. And when he acts, uh, it won't be unbelievably small. It'll start to bring in people, whether the Turks, Turks are in NATO. So if Turkey goes in and tries to attack and it's, it receives a couple of missiles, then the Turks are going to say, well, we're not going to be in NATO unless you invoke your Article 4, whatever it is, too. And you've got to all come on my side. And he's right that legally we would have to. So I, I I just don't think it's a wise thing to to threaten people unless you're you're going to do it. You saw the statement uh, by the uh, general, I forget his name, the former head of the Army War College, uh, who uh, said uh, one of the basic problems is that there's nobody in the White House who's got any experience of war. Another meaning the president is indeed ill-advised or not advised at all. Do you think there's any? Is that part of the picture? Well, I would say I would expand that to diplomacy. So who are the people in the Democratic establishment or the bipartisan establishment that have really credit, had some credibility about matters of foreign affairs? Well, the former Secretary of State, Mrs. Clinton. I don't think she did myself. I think she started this entire problem in the Middle East because it was not Barack Obama who was the first person to say a red line. She did. Yes. The red line first. And then she had no intention. She was the one who said, we're not going to attack Assad. We're going to attack Gaddafi because Assad is a moderate, moderate and a reformer. She said that. She was the one who said, uh, we're going to lead from behind. And she was, or her aide did. And she was the one who got the resolution to go to the UN for a no fly zone in Libya and then de- deliberately violate it for ground support that infuriated the Chinese and the Russians. She was the one who chortled 
We came, we saw Qaddafi died. Uh-huh. The one that said, what difference does it make? She was the one who lied to the families of the Benghazi parents, said it was a video and not a, a stealthy operation and a poorly defended uh, concept. So she, her fingerprints are all over this. What I was thinking. In How so- do you feel, Victor, that, uh, uh, with the, about the thought that she may, you, you may now be talking about the next president of the United States? About that because I think that she, everybody's picking on John Kerry and saying he's incompetent. He's sonorous, he's pontificating, he's ponderous, he's uh, pedantic, but he's trying to correct correct or make no worse the situation that he inherited that she got us in this mess. And she was the original person who said the red line. The thing, point I'm getting at, there were people in the Democratic Party and had worked for both parties who were very adroit, skilled, old pros, so to speak. The problem is that they're dead or they're gone. Richard Holbrook is dead. Uh, Ryan Crocker had health problems and bowed out. Robert Gates is not there, and he's replaced by somebody who's been so traumatized by his confirmation hearings, he's been reduced to being mute. And I mean, uh, ex-Senator Chuck Hagel. Sure, yeah. Martin Dempsey, problem is he's a he's an honest man with integrity who can't lie. So every time they ask him a question under oath, and they have many, uh, who are the insurgents? He tells the truth. I don't know. That's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Yes. How yeah. long would it take to go sort this thing out? Maybe 10 years. Is the air defense more formidable than Libya? Oh, yeah, a lot more formidable. Do you know what our mission would be? No, nobody's told me. So it, there's nobody there. We don't have a David Petraeus. I know he's said things, but he's not actively involved. We don't have Ryan Crocker. These are the people who saved us in Iraq. We didn't have Holbrook, who was pretty good in the Balkans. Um, there's nobody there. Susan Rice, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Samantha Power. These are people who, by any disinterested standard, shouldn't be where they are. Well, Samantha Power, of course, got a Pulitzer Prize some years ago for a book about uh, genocide. And uh, that somehow got parlayed into uh, an appointment at Harvard, which she gave up so that she could go work on Obama's senatorial staff, which he did for about, uh, or did for just about all of his br- brief senatorial career. And then we know that she had a role, uh, though for a while they had to put her on the back, uh, in the back line because she had been, I'm mean, speaking of her role in the uh, election itself, but she had insulted uh, Hillary Clinton, so they put her aside for a bit. But ultimately she emerges as, uh, our of uh, our person at the UN. And uh, a serious she, person. Uh, what? She's serious because she and Susan Rice and Hillary Clinton went to Obama and said that the status quo view of Qaddafi, i.e. that he's a monster in rehabilitation who's sent his westernized progeny out to men fences, who's opening up his vast oil and gas and archaeological sites to European development, and wants to return, reform, and he was being courted. His kids were having art projects and art shows in European cities. That she made the point that, you know, we were a day late and a dollar short back in the Muslim Brotherhood. In Egypt, we've got to go into Libya. We've got to do this. And then cooked up this perversion of the UN resolution and then the bombing uh, from behind. Um, and then when the chaos was over, uh, a big boast that we don't have boots on the ground, and we came, we saw, and Qaddafi's dead, and then we ended up with Su- Mogadishu or Somalia, the Sudan, and Libya. I don't think that was a stellar achievement. So she's been very quiet, and she hasn't said much about Syria because she couldn't. And Susan Rice, who <laughs> misled the country five times in a single day on Benghazi, can't has no credibility. And Joe Biden, who's been everywhere, on his statements has no credibility and Hillary Clinton has no credibility. Do you find Joe Biden's recent statements? And I quote, the Middle East is hopeful. There's hope there. Or John if Kerry I, is one of the great secretary of states of all time. That he's, too. I, I don't mean to be pedantic, but he's not serious. I mean, what I mean by that term is that Samantha Power and Joe Biden do not really believe there is a problem. I'm going to give you a rational answer. And this answer will appeal to people of both political parties by the weight of its logic. 
something that people understand as a possible alternative. Samantha Power is trying to score points as some kind of – she's a woman who said that the NATO alliance should go in and enforce Palestinian rights and the Israelis. She says things that aren't serious because they reflect an ideological zeal on her part. And yeah. Biden – I think Biden has serious psychological problems and is not aware – that the statement he says on Monday is antithetical to the one he says on Monday. Actually, great geopolitical wisdom about the Middle East was laid down a long time ago by another vice president of the United States, by Dan Quayle, who said, and I quote again, the global importance of the Middle East is that it keeps the Far East and the Near East from encroaching on each other. <laughs> well, that seems as witty as anything we've heard lately. Yes. Yeah, so. I must ask you, with uh, only about five minutes left, uh, Quite seriously, you've just recently done a piece which I read, although I, I'm not quoting it at the moment, in which overall you strike a surprising note of optimism about the future of the United States. Are you really that optimistic in the face of the problems we've been discussing uh, so far today? Well, I think we're like we're 1979 or 80, and uh, people finally realize you couldn't have a commander-in-chief who said he had no inordinate fear of communism or – uh, believe that the state was going to take a bigger share of the economy or said something like, I'm going to send F-15s to Saudi Arabia, but they can't have bomb racks on them. Carterism had, re had the logical dividend of Carterism was Afghanistan, Soviets in Afghanistan, the hostages in Tehran, the Shah gone, Khomeiniism, um, Chinese trying to go into Vietnam, communists, you know, you know the whole story. So people of all persuasions, even the ones sympathetic to him, said this can't go on and it can't go on at home. And there has to be another way. And there was. And so I think people will say you can't, this Obamacare is not going to work. It's destroying jobs and you can't have another, another and another stimulus and you can't have just zero interest indefinitely and you can't raise you wanted to go from 35 to 39 percent you went up to 39 percent you got your tax raise and unlike clinton when he went to 39 percent on upper incomes he did balance the budget we have a 750 billion dollar and then if i go into the stuff abroad there's no need to do it but the point i'm making is that there will have to be someone who says this is an unsustainable trajectory and the irony is that Everything that Obama has opposed has kept him, uh, got him reelected. Fracking, new developments of oil, natural gas, horizontal drilling has really radically changed the U.S. He likes to have all these ideas about the university. He leaves, the, but the fact is the university doesn't listen to him. So Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Caltech, MIT are still the world's great centers. And he... He brags about all of the Silicon Valley people, but they don't listen to him. So Google and Facebook and, and Yahoo and, and uh, all of those people are cutting edge innovators and agriculture is booming like it has never boomed in because he, he has not been able to collectivize the farms. And I guess what I'm saying is that compared to whom and to compared to what is America in decline compared to other countries in Europe in terms of energy or compared to the Soviet Union in terms of demography or in terms of China, uh, relative military power. Well, are, are you suggesting, Victor, that he's now rendered essentially irrelevant so that he can't do us very much more harm? Or can he? Yes. With one great qualification, and that is he's like that Tolkien character, the voice of Saruman. He still yes. has voice. And, uh, it's it's a powerful tool. So I think will be I think there'll be a general uh, acceptance by the leaders of both parties and even maybe the media that what he says on major policy issues, domestic and foreign, will not be taken seriously. However, if you go beyond that and try to do to him what the country did to Nixon or Clinton during Montague, uh or Carter, that's a st because of his emblematic importance and what he represents. And his obviously impressive rhetorical skills and his youthful profile that he cuts, I don't think he'll always be somewhat important. He can always weigh in on Trayvon Martin or he can say something 
uh, about a, 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 the latest shooting, or he can say something well, like that. Well, he stands behind uh, the bully pulpit. He's still the yeah. president of the United States. Actually. Exactly. And he, and he has enormous influence. Remember, where, what he's doing right now is that he's completely emasculated abroad, and he's been neutralized at home. All of his initiatives at home uh, since Obamacare have failed. Gun controls failed. Amnesty so far has stalled. Uh, the budget was sequestration was put down his throat, but he's had enormous influence with executive orders by not following the Obamacare, yeah. by not enforcing border security, by going after everything from a good car company to Boeing, by making appointments that are pretty outrageous, not just judicial appointments. So I think he has a lot of clout and he could recover, but. He won't be taken seriously as a person who's going to, as he said, fundamentally transform America. He's, he's done about all he can. It Victor, uh, let, let me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to round this out. We only have about a minute or two left. Uh, you are a very significant historian, one of the great historians. Uh, military history, uh, class, uh, history of the uh, classical world, and of course a great observer of the contemporary scene. Uh, though you sometimes resist being classed as a conservative, there's uh, conservatives read you with great um, uh, enthusiasm and quote you uh, very, very fully. Uh, I say all of that just by way of background, uh, and then I ask you this. What will historians make of uh, this American president? Suppose they're writing about him 50 years from now or thereabouts. What will his rank be? What will his overall evaluation be in the history of the administration of the um, the use of executive power, presidential power, uh, administratively, and in terms of policy innovation, et cetera, et cetera, foreign policy and domestic policy, what will the overall evaluation of Barack Obama be once the uh, well, historical like, dust has settled? I would like to say they're going to try to turn him into Woodrow Wilson, that he was an idealist that was just too good for the nation yeah. so that he failed politically because he wasn't willing to do the dirty compromises necessary. And they will try to do that. That will be the left's way of interpreting him. Would it? Yeah. And I, but I think that what it'll, if I was a, a left wing, well, that'll be because most historians in the university are left wing. But I think that sure? for a while, people will say something along the following. Obama had an ambitious uh uh, effort to transform America into a more pro progressive trajectory and that he was opposed by forces of reactionary uh, uh, obstructionism. And unfortunately, he didn't. He lacked the political skills. He lost his majority in the House, and I think he'll lose it in the Senate. And he was stymied. However, he remains a uh, an iconic president because of his unique uh, first African-American to be uh, elected president, he conducted himself with grace, da 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 da. So he will not go down like otherwise. I think he'd go down like Millard Fillmore or James Buchanan because uh, he has a very similar everything he's done except Obamacare has been a complete failure. And he's taken, he's ruined the, he's taken an economy that was bound to have a natural recovery and he's turned it into a perennial near recession. Uh, the budget is a mess. The uh, aggregate debt is a mess. The unemployment has really destroyed minority hopes and aspirations. And he's polarized the country. He's taken race relations back 20 years, class relations, gender relations. And uh, it's not going to be – it's it's not a good legacy the way I feel, other than his iconic value for a lot of people. When you have the – you know, people said he was a god or he uh, – his pants, the crease in his pants leg was a, it was a predicator of how great he would be. When you have that type of, uh, devotion to him and what he represents, then it's going to be very hard for them to be embarrassed themselves and say, you know, I was, I was totally wrong. He was a Pied Piper. But I think that's what he was. Victor Davis Hanson, I thank you so much for, as usual, a very, very exciting and a very illuminating discussion. But I have one word of advice for you. Next time we talk, you have to stop holding back and begin to say <laughs> what you really mean. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, Victor. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.